So let's uh, uh, start with, uh, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the Citizens Foundation. This is a non-profit uh, foundation founded in Iceland in, in 2008. But let me first take you back uh, almost 1100 years. So uh, so this is a, like a painting of, uh, of, of, of Thingvellir, which is called Parliament Field. Uh, it was in 930, uh, the Viking families that uh, were running Iceland, they decided to come together and, uh, and run a parliament, which was actually a tradition, like a Viking tradition. But it's like a countrywide thing where all the families came together to uh, practice this form sort of, uh, you know, a, a participatory democracy of a kind. And uh, one of the key reasons for uh, this sort of uh, participatory structure was that was actually violence, you know, the Viking clans, uh, you know, often family clans, you know, as, as many in the 900s, you know, used to be uh, quite violent. And uh, and the parliament was set up uh, for one of the key reasons to actually to uh, help uh, solve disputes, uh, help to stop a cycle of violence where there were blood revenge and so on and so on. Um, quite common in the 900s, and also as, 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 I'm guessing not only in, in, in Iceland, and uh, and this uh, parliament, uh, I think, uh, has been more or less uh, continuously going uh, uh, since this time. And uh, in generally, uh, I mean, it was sort of chiefs in the beginning, and but it's been more and more inclusive. And generally, uh, you know, the people have trusted the parliament. It's been an institution of trust for over a thousand years. Uh, a hundred years ago, we uh, uh, were more or less with a sort of, a, you know, voting system as we have today. People would go on, they would go vote for every four years. They would go on horseback even, or they would walk for days to the, to the polling place. They would even meet the representatives in the street. Uh, you know, there was not many people in Iceland uh, uh, at that time. But then sort of the modernity came quickly in Iceland. We had the car in the 30s, the first computers in the 60s. The information highway uh, opened in 1993, and uh, but the democratic system has not uh, evolved very much. We've basically uh, been at, at the same uh, uh, same system at least for 100 years, but you know to some extent for for uh, much longer. So then, in 2008, the financial crisis hit Iceland, and it hit Iceland. I mean, really bad. I mean, in terms of that, we are a small country. And we had uh, three commercial, like, uh, you know, proper banks that had just been privatized, you know, just like 10, 15 years earlier. And they all went bankrupt over a period of uh, 10 days. And, uh, and people were really, really upset, uh, you know, and they felt that, uh, you know, the government had let them down. The government had been talking the banks up, saying that Iceland would be a... Uh, you know, you know, Dubai of the North, like a big financial center. And, you know, it turned not to be based on uh, really good decisions. So, you know, people were in the streets, they were protesting at the pots and pants revolution. I was actually living in London at the time. Uh, I had uh, lived away from Iceland for 17 years as an entrepreneur and was running a company in London. And, uh, and, uh, and during that process, actually on the 18th of uh, October 2008, uh, there was a big protest in, in, in Iceland and, and I was in London and uh, not feeling, uh, uh, you know, or feeling, <laughs> you know, a bit upset not being able to participate because I was quite uh, upset as well about how, uh, how uh, you know, how the situation was with uh, what was happening. Uh, and uh, so I started to work on uh, with some people on the ground in Iceland this idea of uh, using the internet to give people uh, more influence. Uh, and the thing is that I had actually, uh, it was some good people in 1993, started the first internet company in Iceland, connecting people to the internet and making websites and so on. I started the first internet company also in Denmark in 1995. And uh, the big promise of the internet, uh, the internet utopia in, in the early 90s, was that the internet was really going to give people a voice. It's going to help to democratize uh, the world, you know, and obviously connect people and, and all of that. But in 2008, uh, when, when me and, you know, and really Gunnar Grimson, who was my co-founder, uh, when we started to really look at this, 
yes, we could see the internet. The internet was connecting people, giving people voices, but the democratic system was absolutely sort of uncoupled uh, from the internet in a way. Yes, governments uh, obviously had websites and so on, and there was, uh, uh, you know, many uh, uh, <coughs> participatory experiments going on and have been, you know, for a long time, uh, you know, online. But uh, but there was uh, still not a lot of uh, uh, connection by actually giving citizens a voice using the internet. So we started to uh, 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 do experiments and uh, and create open source software and uh, and uh, to basically fulfill the mission of uh, of uh, connecting government and citizens and. Uh, creating state-of-the-art uh, open source platforms and basically come up with ideas about processes that would help make better decisions. Because in the end, uh, that's what uh, the people in the streets in the pots and pans revolution were not happy about. They were not happy about the, a series of poor quality decisions that were made by their government. And uh, so the idea is that uh, as we live in a ever more complex world is that uh, we need citizens and government to work more closely together to make better, better decisions, you know, to use taxpayer money more effect effectively, to have the decision be fairer and better in a very wide modern scope where, you know, it's not only good for money, but it's also good for the planet. It's good for uh, the health, uh, the physical health, the mental health of the population. So, so such a multidimensional, you know, decision-making process, you know, uh, we feel is best served by being in collaboration uh, between uh, uh, governments and citizens. So, uh, so you say we uh, we founded in 2008. We have two uh, we have two uh, small offices in the United States and UK. There are two people in the United States as a separate nonprofit. I mean, one person part time in the UK. We are very tiny. We are only three people here in Iceland, and we are still sort of a struggling nonprofit in terms of uh, living, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, contract or uh, if, you know, uh, grant to grant and so on. I'm sure you know that well. Uh, but we have uh, our platform has been uh, used in literally thousands of of engagement projects, and including hundreds of successful projects in in countries uh, in, in in over 20 countries, so like Better Reykjavik and Scottish Parliament. We've done uh, uh, 10 years of online participatory budgeting, mostly in Iceland, but also a bit in Scotland and uh, in Norway. And, uh, and uh, actually in other countries as well. And, and now in Iceland, we have all the projects have uh, over 12% participation rate. And the record in a, a town in Iceland is 19.7%. So those are the number of people on the voting registry that are taking part in this uh, new uh, 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 process. And uh, uh, a little overview of uh, uh, the solutions we've developed over the years. We have uh, your priorities, which is an idea generation and, and policy deliberation uh, tool and platform. We have uh, open active voting, which is uh, a, a budget voting tool and, and a civic education tool as well. We have uh, open active policy, which is a, what we call a deep policy making gamification platform. Uh, I'll show you a little bit about that later. We made a, a game called Make Your Constitution. It was used as part of uh, uh, the Icelandic uh, 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 constitution crowdsourcing we'll talk about later. And we have uh, uh, social listening uh, through the Pace Common Crow Scanner, which, uh, which, uh, which listens and searches the web for different topics that uh, can be important when it comes to uh, uh, citizen engagement and understanding more uh, um, the, the attitudes of people and so on. And we start with uh, your priorities. And, you know, as, as mentioned before, the idea is to have a platform that helps uh, make better, better decision to, uh, uh, to help build up trust by uh, allowing uh, uh, governments and citizens to uh, uh, work together in a safe way. And it's also easy to use and is uh, sort of gamified to the you know, most extent. I, I actually uh, spent over uh, 
10 years in the video game industry uh, before in founding the Citizens Foundation and, uh, and you know, launched actually, you know, several best-selling you know, mobile games. And uh, so, so that's sort of a bit my background in terms of where I come from this. It's, uh, you know, we need to make uh, tools that are fun and easy to use. Uh, we had over 2 million people have visited websites, uh, uh, you know, using the platform. It, it scales well to small and, 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 and big projects. And uh, it's been used, uh, uh, I say, over 20 countries. And the premise of your priorities is, is, is quite simple. It's all about ideas and then uh, a deliberation about those ideas. So citizen art ideas, they are deliberation points, and then they can like and dislike uh, ideas. So this is a screenshot. You will uh, see a lot of uh, different your priorities, uh, you, you know, you know, projects. Uh, uh, you know, today in the next few hours, and uh, this is uh, a project in Malta where you and you you click to add a new idea, and then people add different ideas, and they uh, uh, can view uh, other people's idea. So say this is all, uh, all uh, you know, in the ideas that, that it's as simple as possible. And but the key uh, element to make any of this work is that uh, that the del deliberation is constructive. Uh, and when we launched our first uh, test platform in, in uh, uh, 2009 called Shadow Parliament, where we were bringing laws from the Icelandic Parliament uh, um, into our platform uh, called Shadow Parliament, and uh, people uh, uh, could comment on the laws that were being you know, discussed and voted them up or down to give their view. And the first day we launched this, in the first evening, and we had like a like a regular commenting system as you have on Facebook where so somebody says something and then you have a thread, somebody says something else and so on. So in that first evening when we launched the platform, there was this new law about fisheries policies. And we had three people that were in a horrible personal arguments on our website. They were saying like, oh, you know, you are horrible, you know, like, I know who your father is and stuff like that. It was, it was really, really bad. And me and Gunnar, we looked at each other and we thought like, Oh great! We have created one more place on the internet for people to argue. So uh, this led us uh, really into a deep uh, uh, sort of problem-solving mode, and we looked for inspirations for from uh, uh, many different places. And we came up with this idea of uh, instead of uh, asking people to just comment on the ideas, we sort of thought like, oh, let's put them to work. So let's let's have, ask people to come up with the best points for and against those ideas. So when people come to, uh, uh, you know, they see an idea that somebody has submitted, we ask them, you know, yeah, give us a point for and a point against. And uh, when people have uh, put in a point for and against, let's say that I put, uh, I, I write a point for some idea and I put it in the system and it pops up for everybody. Uh, then other people can vote it up or down. But let's say some of my like like let's say a friend comes there and and he sees my really silly uh, point, uh, he can vote it down, but he actually he cannot uh, comment on it and tell me how silly I am. It's just not physically possible. There is no reply button, you know. So the only thing that people can do in terms of if they do want to argue uh, about something, then if they see a point for something and they don't agree with it, they will have to write a standalone uh, counterpoint. Uh, that uh, and uh, this really works uh, like magic, you know, <laughs> in a way is that uh, and to say we've, you know, done projects in over 20 countries and I can't count how many times people have said, oh, well, it works in Iceland, you know, everybody's so polite there or whatever. And uh, but in my, my country, you know, you should see Facebook, you know, in my country, people are like, oh, my Facebook is so bad. But the thing is that Facebook is really, really bad here in Iceland as well. I mean, the things people say under a name to another a neighbor of theirs, just because they're like in the flow of arguing about some abstract things often that are really not that important often, you know, but anyway, so uh, and also uh, a key element of uh, of the deliberation is that uh, uh, the minority and majority views have equal weight. Uh, so, you know, so the minority uh, comments don't get buried, uh, you know, down by the comments of the majority. And this is really important just to, because we and governments are partners, they want to see both sides of, of, of everything. 
And here's just a, a quick example. This is from a, a crowdsourcing of the Icelandic education policy in, in, uh, in 2030. No, no, sorry, two, yeah, until 2030. Uh, this was done a couple of years ago. And so this is somebody who put in the idea of, of basically making the New Testament required again in, 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 in Icelandic schools. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, it will be distributed there. And uh, and uh, this is, well, first, I mean, this would not, uh, we have laws for uh, religious freedom and stuff in Iceland, so this would not fly for that. But we had this uh, deliberation, hundreds of people came in there uh, to let their views uh, know about this. And, you know, we didn't have to delete a single comment. You know, can you imagine if somebody, uh, you know, two, uh, you know, two groups meeting online uh, that are totally have different views on this. And uh, so I mean, thought it was quite interesting, you know, and, and this is replicated uh, over and over again for all sorts of different uh, subjects. Uh, your priorities has uh, uh, over the years, and that's sort of my background from the gaming industry, uh, I'm an uh, artificial intelligence specialist, and, uh, and we have integrated AI into many different uh, aspects of the platform, anything for, from something simple like machine translations, uh, and uh, we have recommendations uh, uh, which we use uh, in a constructive way. We have speech to text. People can submit ideas using their voice or with video, and we convert it automatically. Or actually, not we. We use in this case for that AI. We use actually a Google a service who, to, who, who converts the speech to text. All the content uh, is analyzed for toxicity when it comes in, and. Uh, um, and admins are notified immediately if, if, if there's a high likelihood of toxicity. I mean, the design really takes care of most toxicity, but there's once in a while one 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 on one comment that, uh, that we would not like to see because of toxicity. And, and then admins are notified right away and, and they can then remove the comment. And, and something that we sort of started more recently is to have uh, natural language processing uh, to help uh, understand the content, the ideas to show trends of similar ideas and so on. And uh, this is actually an example of that. This is uh, where you uh, uh, can actually look at uh, uh, a project and you can have uh, AI automatically cluster together similar ideas. And, uh, and as I said, it's sort of an exper experimental features at the moment, or you know, looking how uh, how governments can post, uh, best use this. And you can also have this sort of 3D view. So, so you get like the cluster of, uh, of similar ideas are all sort of bundled up together uh, you know, in this view. As I said, we're this is still very highly experimental. We're, we're still uh, looking towards making this uh, uh, more useful, but this gives uh, a government a good trend. Oh, so what are all those ideas in the middle? You know, those are, this is the biggest trending uh, you know, topics and how they connect to other ideas. And uh, uh, governments use, use the platform. Uh, we have schools engaging with students. We have academics co-creating master's programs, nonprofits uh, engaging with uh, stakeholders, political parties uh, engaging with citizens and doing also internal private work. You can create uh, private communities on your priorities that are just used for uh, internal work. <laughs> and uh, uh, your priorities, you know, uh, offers uh, a really wide range of, of inputs. Uh, it's been in sort of agile user-centric development in, yeah, since 2008. And we have had so many different types of projects that, that have wanted to use the platform. So there's a lot of configuration options in terms of how you can set it up. You can have people submit uh, 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 you know, very simple, just a name and description for the idea. You can ask a few questions uh, when you're uh, uh, asking people for you know, submitting ideas all the way into more complex survey forms with like, you know, you know, radio buttons, you know, drop downs, and even you, you can configure the system to accept like rich text input, like with bold and lists and so on. Same with the likes, dislikes, you can, you can have, you know, like, you know, vote up or down or like up or down or hearts. We can also set it up, set the system up with sort of what we call an emoji ratings where you have up to four sort of Likert scale ratings for each idea. Um, and that's a bit different way of approaching uh, uh, those inputs. The outputs uh, of the system is that all, it's, it's an API driven system. So uh, um, 
all the APIs uh, that run the web apps, uh, they are accessible, uh, you know, just in a programmatic way. And uh, users can create API keys for, for managing uh, private data. Um, you can download everything in, in, in XLS documents and also sort of more reporting style docx. Uh, your priorities is a web app. It's uh, the it's uh, the client uh, is a separate app uh, from the backend API, and it's a progressive web app. It's, it downloads into the browser and then fetches all the data without reloading the page. It's really fast, even on a, a forty nine dollar smartphone, uh, which is really important for some of our international projects. The your priorities projects uh, can be installed uh, on uh, phone home screens. So every community on your priorities, you can put like an app icon to it, you can put a little short uh, 12 uh, character name, and then uh, uh, your community effectively can be installed on uh, browsers uh, on, 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 as a standalone app, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, users phones. And, uh, and you can add, uh, you, so if you visit the site, and then you lose your connection, you can keep on working, you can keep on adding ideas and on points. And then when you have an internet connection, it will, uh, it will resume and they will upload. So, so in, in, in most respects, it works like a, a native app, except you don't need to install it from the app store. You just visit the website, the app goes into the browser. It's really cool. It's, 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 it's you know, supported by, uh, you know, Chrome and Safari and, and, you know, Firefox and everybody. Um, and it's a way of sort of, uh, an, uh, making the app experience you know more accessible and and uh, and uh, we really take advantage of that so the key outcomes with your priorities is that we have uh, basically improved communities we use collective intelligence uh, we uh, for governments uh, they get pros and cons for uh, for its ideas we have increased civil knowledge by participants and uh, ultimately higher public acceptance uh, of uh, how, uh, how, how citizens can come uh, and be a part of decision making. And here are just, this is actually an old, old chest, this is just some of our projects in, 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 in Iceland and, and, uh, and uh, around Europe. So some of our partners in, in, uh, in, in Iceland, those are some of our international partners over the years, there's actually a, a lot more now. Uh, and, uh, and just a quickly here on example projects, Better Reykjavik was our first uh, sort of big success, where we uh, we started in uh, in uh, in in 2010 with our newly redesigned platform, where we had the debating system. So we launched uh, a, a, pro a project called Shadow City a week before the city election, and uh, and we had saved up about 10,000 euros, and we spent it all on Facebook advertisements on in 2010. Almost nobody was advertising on Facebook at the time. So we had, you know, and everybody was getting on Facebook. So we had a lot of people. We had over 40% of the voters, you know, participated and uh, over 1,000 ideas were generated. And the party that was leading the polls uh, really sort of jumped on the opportunity and told their representatives or their, uh, you know, future voters to go there. Uh, then uh, the best party uh, won the election and they went into coalition talk with the... Uh, 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 yeah, with the social democrats and uh, and on the morning of the election win they called us up and they said we want to make this platform uh, you know part of the you know our 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 uh, political platform and but they didn't like the name shadow city so so we together came up with uh, this name we're calling it better Reykjavik, and uh, and uh, and from there it became a uh, 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 a co-creation project, you know, from the Citizens Foundation and the city of Reykjavik. And uh, there was a lot of uh, effort to make sure that it was uh, sort of de depolis, you know, it was not a part of a political project, but it was a part of the city administration. And uh, you will see some demos of this. We'll, uh, the next presentation will talk about my district, uh, which, uh, which is uh, the participatory budgeting project in Iceland. And you can see here we have uh, over 34,000 uh, registered users. There's a uh, you know 100,000 people plus on the voting registry in in, in Reykjavik. Over 10,000 ideas have been submitted over the years, and uh, and 22,000 uh, 23,000 debate points. 
And um, here's a screenshot from the participatory budgeting project in 2017. I'm not sure why I have such an old slide, but you will see the 2020-2021 the uh, project later. I'll, I'll do a little live demo of that. Um, in 2018, uh, uh, the city, as I mentioned briefly earlier, was working on creating an education policy for uh, until 2030. And uh, there were two crowdsourcing opportunities in this policy making. In the beginning of the process, uh, the city asked people uh, uh, to uh, come up with ideas on what are the key main uh, sort of high level targets of the policy. And then towards the end of the policy making process, citizens again were asked like nine months later, how do you then implement uh, practically uh, the, the goals? How do you reach those goals of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of creating a good education policy? The University of Iceland uh, has used uh, uh, the platform and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and many others. Uh, in Iceland, we also had uh, uh, the platform used for constitutional changes and we'll have a, a completely a separate presentation on that uh, a little bit late, later this, uh, this morning after the, after the break. So I'm not gonna talk you know, more about that now. Uh, we also have a website called Better Iceland, which is uh, like a joint website where we're actually mostly, uh, well, the national government uses it. And uh, also we have, uh, uh, we have 14 uh, municipalities that are uh, using your priorities, including all the largest ones uh, outside Reykjavik, except one. And, but we have, uh, so we have uh, towns, uh, we have a town of 267 people <laughs> where well, we use the platform. I'll also your screen of that in a minute. And uh, most are, most are sort of learning from Reykjavik, the city of Reykjavik, as it's, uh, you know, as it's been sort of the originator of all of this, but also, uh, um, you know, some of them are all are innovating some new participation methods using the platform, which, which even, uh, you know, city of Reykjavik, uh, you know, is learning from. So it's a virtuous cycle of, of, uh, of innovation. And here you can see a screenshots of the Better Iceland website. It has many, many different projects. This is a project from Reykjanes, which is the which is the municipality by the airport. Uh, they obviously had very COVID related uh, setbacks because of so much of their people are working in services, uh, you know, connected to the airport. So they, they've been uh, crowdsourcing ideas and uh, how to uh, create an employment. We had a municipality in Christmas, they used the platform to uh, have people submit uh, and then vote in a secure uh, binding EID vote about what was the best decorated house for Christmas. So, so that was a fun, uh, fun little project. Uh, uh, and this project actually housed Flattery and Flattery is actually the there's two there's 267 people who live in Flatteria and and we had uh, 57 people uh, took part in this uh, crowdsourcing about how can they how what can they do to uh, improve their town how, how how can they make it more livable and so on and uh, it's an example from uh, about the public health uh, policy making effort uh, um, about the traffic safety plans that are being made so you know, it's not participation in Iceland and in those projects is not only about, uh, 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 you know, something big or, or big budgets and so on, but also about just small pieces of policy where, where citizen input can actually uh, help make better decisions. Uh, so I'm not going to go much into this, but open active voting is our, uh, is our uh, uh, open source voting platform where, uh, you know, we will have a presentation on this just after, uh, after this, so I'm not going to go directly much into this, but this is the, the My District project. This is an example of the platform. I'll do a live demo later, so, so I'll just skip over this really quickly. And we have, uh, you know, many municipalities are, are doing this. All the bigger, well, almost all the bigger municipalities are not doing this sort of similar PP projects in, 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 in Iceland. And you see some results. So some older, older photos actually, Edu could have some newer photos of some of the resulting projects. And we've helped with uh, projects and, uh, you know, PP projects in many uh, parts of Europe, including we, we, we consulted for a year to help uh, build the Decide Madrid in Spain, and, uh, but also acted in Croatia and Slovenia, you know, Slovenia. <laughs> and uh, 
And this again, this is a really quick overview because we have a, a you know a, a, a better you know presentation about this later. Uh, plus, a part of the um, a, the constitution crowdsourcing with this open active policy. It's a platform for uh, creating uh, sort of educational games uh, about uh, about policy, and uh, in a way to show citizens how their values, uh, you know, in this case, affect constitutional policy choices, and. Uh, and we'll go into detail in, in, in how this uh, uh, works later. And uh, I'll talk you through each of those screens. And finally, on, 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 the pro on the projects that we have, then we have uh, our open source project. This is sort of the, the more like recent one uh, called the PACE Common Crawl Scanner. This is a part of an EU funded project uh, called PACE we're a part of. And this uh, a tool basically crawls Common Crawl. Common Crawl is the largest uh, uh, public archive of web pages. So every month, a nonprofit in California, they crawl uh, 4 billion web pages and put them on a, a free to download Amazon uh, public data set where we can scan it for keywords. And we'll be using this, uh, you know, in the Code Euro project uh, to uh, search in many different languages for, uh, for, uh, 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 for, ideas connected to air quality, obviously, and we'll be working with you on designing that and so on. So I'll be, I will share those presentations later so you can take, you know, more, it will go and you can look at more detail of this uh, uh, later. And here's a screenshot from uh, like a working prototype of, of uh, the dashboard we have on the PACE project where we're measuring uh, over the years, uh, different types of populist related narratives, uh, how, how, what the volume is, what the trends are. So what have we learned? And I know I'm uh, uh, I'm a bit behind in the time. Uh, so participation must be fun. That's that was the fun. That was the first thing we realized. It needs to be simple. It needs to be something that is uh, accessible and so on. And uh, uh, yeah. So you know, there's a lot of competition for civic work. You know, Facebook, uh, TikTok. You know, I mean, what not. So. You know, it can't be sort of bureaucratic. It must be simple, fun, so on. You need to reward citizens for taking part in terms of, you, don't, you know, in terms of using their ideas, listening to their uh, feedback uh, and communicate the results. Even if you have a no uh, that you tell people that this idea can't be implemented, people really respect uh, hearing back from you and then knowing that, uh, th that that's the case. And... Uh, but in our key, uh, our case, and we, uh, you know, come through this through uh, f f sort of from the commercial world, then the key to reaching citizens is to let them know about it. So communication and realistic marketing budgets are, are critical. And, you know, here's sort of a, a basic model of, of, uh, of, of how we reach citizens. Uh, and uh, uh, so on the left, you can see governments and civil society. They and then they go from left to right. They do campaigns, uh, and you have social media marketing: uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Google, and so on. Uh, people see your ad. Uh, the citizens see your ad. They click onto the platform and they take part. And ideas are uh, are uh, uh, are generated. But also, citizens then share on social media. Uh, their outputs and then other people click on it and there's this virtue cycle is that if you uh, have a good enough campaign um, in our case you know 30 percent of the clicks come through a campaign a paid campaign but then 70 percent of, of, of clicks come from people uh, sharing this sharing other people's content and finally uh, on uh, that one of the reasons why we uh, uh, decided to uh, start as a nonprofit is that uh, we've seen this uh, see where uh, uh, I really believe that uh, our digital democratic infrastructure should be public. It should be nonprofit, and uh, and there is uh, some danger that that we have that the digital transformation of democracy will also mean the privatization of our democratic infrastructure. We've seen over the past decade how uh, how. Uh, how things have been uh, uh, privatized uh, in terms of the public square, in terms of uh, when we go online, uh, we are almost uh, always under a, 
a, a sort of an ad-driven model when we communicate with other people. We, we believe that's that's uh, that's not the way forward. That we need to make sure that uh, uh, that we that the that our democratic infrastructure is, is public and not for profit. And uh, and you you can look at the you know the technical overview for open source platform. You can take a look at this. Uh, uh, you know, if you're interested, I'm not. I'm sure, like some of you might be interested in this, but uh, but uh, but probably many of you are not. So so please take a look at uh, this uh, if you want to you know download the presentation later. And uh, thank you so much for that. I'm stop sharing, and uh, now it's time for questions. Sorry, such a just a quick question, Robert. Will you be uh, um, sharing the slides as well? Yeah, I'll be sharing the slides, and uh, and it is being recorded, so uh, okay. um, you know we'll be able to uh, look at the recording as well. But I will send uh, all the slides, uh, you know, to uh, everybody after after this meeting. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. It was really interesting. Thanks. Um. Robert, I was wondering, uh, first of all, uh, really impressive work that you are doing in Iceland. Uh, but one thing that really caught my attention in the very beginning is when you uh, said uh, that you somehow has managed to create a system where minority views are not drowned out by the noise or by yes. majority. And I was wondering uh, what exactly did you do to achieve that? Well, actually, I mean, it was it was really simple in terms of that. Uh, because in terms of how the idea generation and, and deliberation works, then you know, I mean, the dynamics is that you have uh, that you have uh, you know often you have ideas that a lot of people support or they say they support, and then you have a minority that you know has a different view, and so so on desktop we basically uh, uh, have uh, you know two columns, so you have the ideas for and the ideas against. And they have the same level in the user interface. So even if you have a thousand people who support something and they have hundreds of comments, you know, and say, oh, it's so great. This is the perfect idea, you know. And then you have a minority, maybe 10 people, and they might still have something really good to say. And they, and they have the whole right side of the screen, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, they will not, uh, not uh, uh, be, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, people will, you know, notice it immediately. And, and, uh, and on mobile, then we sort of interleave it so 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 we have one night we have 1.4 one against 1.4 one against so all the views are sort of at the top uh, and 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 this is actually you know is you know it does not only have like a, a sense of uh, you know fighting against the internet just having the loudest voices being heard but it's also very practical because even if you have, have thousand people who like something and 10 people who don't like it the feedback from the people who don't like it, they might have really important information, you know? They might say, well, it's just not possible because of this, this and that, you know? So, so, it's, so it's a really important bit of uh, helping to improve decision-making is, is to let, uh, you know, majority and minority voices on, on any subject, uh, 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 yeah, you know, be sort of heard and, and be seen in the user interface. My second question would be, uh, how are you usually creating these uh, new new websites for uh, meant for specific occasion? Do you have some broad vision in your mind and then you just uh, program it? Or is it um, trials and errors uh, with constant adaptations? What's the process is like? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's very, uh, say, like a modern uh, agile process, like, a, you know, user centric in a way that you know, I mean, we have effectively two types of users, or if in, in our view, we have we have our partners, our government partners, and then we have the citizens or or users who are using who are the end users, if you like. And so, so basically, the platform has been like in constant development since two thousand and eight, uh, and always responding to needs of either the government users or the the citizen end users. So, so that's how it's been developed, it, like all, all the time. So. So yes, we have some ideas in terms of uh, a vision, you know, but like the debating system, for example, 
when we launched the first platform, we, we just thought, oh, we'll just have comments, you know, they don't worry about it. But then it was horrible, you know, and then so it forced us into, uh, you know, innovating, uh, you know, to solve a problem that came up. And, uh, and this is how it has been, uh, you know, all those years uh, uh, that we have. Uh, uh, yeah. So a couple of more questions. Uh, I, I can say, you know, Simon and Elisa, either one, Simon. I would give the floor to Elisa. Probably we have similar questions. Okay. No, it's okay. <laughs> Just a second. I'll also turn on my video. No, I was more interested, like uh, in what you said about the privatization of infrastructures for democratic processes, because, like, I know that there are two kind of schools of thoughts, right? So infrastructures can be open source, I think, like how you uh, uh, have them, but also there are private companies, and I know many of them who are um, selling their platforms and making a profit out of them. So I was just wondering, like, um, what do you think about this, uh, this model in which there are these companies that are really quite, you know, selling their, their platforms all the time, and they have a, a closed source platform, so you can't know, like, how their technology is um, and do you think uh, I mean that in the future like really for democratic processes in Europe uh, there should just be you know non-profit open source um, technology if we really want to make this democratic or do you think that you know also private companies can so so Elisa yes I'm, I have a you know I mean quite a bit of uh, uh, ideas about that. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing it, you know, because I mean, we are trying all sorts of different approaches, you know, to mm -hmm. this. But I think that maybe we should, uh, you know, maybe look at this question in more detail and the final section about sort of the future of democracy and technology. And, uh, and because we are sort of running a bit behind time and we have Eriko here from the city of Reykjavik that will, uh, you know, that, you know, that is about to do a presentation, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, That's perfect. Uh, we can leave it for later. Yeah, let, 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 let's leave it because it's pretty, you know, and it sort of fits with the final theme of looking towards the future and so on. And and Simon, just really quick, if you have. Yes, actually, I have three questions, but I will just choose the last one, which is also relating to the code project. It's about the uh, how do you evaluate the success of your projects? Do you have any external um, evaluator who is having kind of framework um, or they're just doing it by yourself kind of as impressive it's, because I, I was interesting uh, I saw some cases that your platforms tools were used in Slovenia and I don't know whether there was any um, analysis of the impact or how these tools actually had any um, added value well it, it's really project dependent on different projects like for example uh, uh, you know the my district project which uh, sorry eric could be running a bit behind time <laughs> but we'll start That's that awesome. in uh, just one minute uh, you know uh, you know th there's been several different evaluation of the my district projects over the years by you know by sort of you know by the university of iceland for example you know at some point so it's it's really just i mean we don't have any specific framework for that that's absolutely dependent on the government uh, partners we're working with uh, what sort of uh, you know framework for that uh, for our world bank projects which i'll talk about a bit more in detail they have an extremely uh, you know organized framework for evaluating their projects you know like it's it's like you know it's a uh, yeah and i'll you know talk about that later so it's anything from no evaluation for smaller projects into an extreme uh, extremely organized evaluation by somebody like the world bank 